but I just, I love that commercial. I think that's so cool. And right in line with what we're talking about as far as gifts that matter, because here's this little boy, and he's got this boxer sled full of Cokes, which I don't know how much that costs. Probably not very much. You can get them on sale at Target now, I think. There I go, making another promotion. But taking the time to look and see some people who maybe need a boost or need just a shot of Coke and some encouragement because this is the season of gift giving. And the thing that we can struggle with is whether or not we can afford to be a part of this season. We are encouraged in every way to get out there and get it going as far as spending money and uh, making sure that we give everybody a very holly jolly Christmas. There's Black Friday, and you don't have to wait for Black Friday because there's pre-Black Friday, and actually Black Friday lasts all month now. It's more of a philosophy than it is an actual day. And you go from Black Friday, then there's Small Business Saturday, and you get the day off on Sunday, but then there is Cyber Monday, which lasts all month as well. Then there's Giving Tuesday, which that's a, a good thing. We need to get out there and spend and turn this economy around. It is your civic duty to do that, whether you can afford to do it or not. And some of this stuff gets kind of pricey. Do you know what the number one toy is this year, the must-have toy this year? Hatchimals. Hatchimals. Yeah, it's this little thing. It's an animal in an egg. And as I've heard it explained, you hold this egg close to you, and you can tap on the egg, and whatever's in there will tap back at you, which sounds kind of creepy to me. But you hold, you hold this, and eventually this thing hatches out. And when I look at it, it looks like you only get one hatch. It doesn't do it over and over again. And what happens? I don't know. You put it in the box. What happens if he hatches early and it's all busted up before your kid even gets in there? I don't know if you get your money back. I went on Amazon yesterday looking, and they're going on a guaranteed Hatchimal from Amazon right now is going for between $260 and $300. And you can find them for more than that on eBay. And after we were done, first service, this lady came up to me. She was so excited because this weekend she had gone to Toys R Us and got in line at 3 in the morning and she got one. She bagged one for, uh, for Christmas. So, wow, how bad do you want one of these? And how willing are you to go into debt to give a very Merry Christmas to your kids and the other people on your shopping list? Well, there's a lot of places you can go on the web that will explain to you what to do if you really can't afford to give a lot of gifts this Christmas. How you break that news to your friends and to your family. But the good news is, is that there are some wonderful things that we can give to people that we love, people that we know. There are ways that we can encourage people in need, people that we don't know, that won't cost us anything. And all it boils down to is God saying to us, I mean, the first and foremost thing we want to do is to honor God with whatever we do during this season, right? I mean, it is all about Jesus, right? And Him coming and giving the great gift of Himself to us. And that's why we give gifts in the first place. And so, as we want to honor God more than anyone at this time, He says, the way you honor me best and most is if you turn around and love the people around you, and especially those people who aren't getting much love, those people maybe out on the margins, out on the fridge, maybe difficult to love for whatever reason, those are the people I want you to care about and to gift. And you can do that no matter, it's not a financial concern. doesn't matter a bit. All you have to do is look and see what do you got in your hand already? What is already there in your life? And if you turn that over to God, say, God, how could this be used to be a blessing to somebody else? He'll show you how to do that. The gift you can afford is already there in your hand. Here's some examples of that. Moses. Moses was living the life in, in Midian. He had left Egypt. Actually, he was on the run from Egypt. He had, well, he killed somebody. <laughs> he killed somebody. And he had a bounty on his head. And so he ran to the desert. He was 40 years of age when he ran to the desert. And actually, things worked out pretty well for him there. 
met a nice girl, nice Midianite girl. He settled down, had a couple of boys. His father-in-law set him up in business. He had flocks. He was a shepherd. Things were going well. He was 80 years of age, still feeling pretty good. Both, both his hips were intact, did, no cataracts. Medicare was covering medical bills, little golf here and there. Life was good until God came calling. And God had a better idea for Moses as to what he could start doing at 80 years of age. And here's what he said to him. He said, Moses, I'm sending you back to Egypt. And you're going to go to Pharaoh, march right into his throne room, and you're going to demand that he release my people, who are your people, the Hebrew people, who were in terrible oppression and slavery. Yeah, that's, that's what you're going to do. I mean, that would be like marching into North Korea and demanding of that dictator, whatever his name is, and saying, I want you to let all the people out of prison now. How do you think that would go over? Not well. Well, Moses had some issues to raise with God, and he said, there's, there's been a mistake here. I am not your man. It's for one thing, there, there's a price on my head. If I go back, I'm going to get arrested. I'll probably get executed. I don't talk so good. I'm not articulate. I'm not eloquent. And God covered all of those bases, had explained how all of that was going to be taken care of. And finally, Moses says to God, he said, what if they don't believe me? Or listen to me. And they say, the Lord did not appear to you, did he? I mean, that's, isn't that a fairly legitimate concern? If someone comes to you and says, God spoke to me personally last night. Actually, he appeared to me in a burning bush and told me that there's something I need to say to you. I would want some documentation for that. Well, God said this to Moses. He said, okay, Moses, what is that in your hand? What are you holding in your hand? And Moses said, well... It's a staff. It was a shepherd's staff. Very ordinary. Just a big branch off of a tree that he'd whittled down. They were a dime a dozen. You used them in those days to to tend sheep. You used them to drive off predators. I always liked it in in the Ten Commandments movies with Charlton Heston. When they were there, he was out in the desert and he was just meeting his wife. She wasn't his wife yet. And these bullies come and they're trying to mess with the women and the sheep. And man, he gets out that staff and he turns into like this ninja guy and he's whooping these bullies and driving them off. Well, that's what he had. He had a shepherd's staff. But it had really no value to it. They were a dime a dozen. If he'd put it on eBay for sale, people would laugh. You know, what do we need with that? We can find those anywhere. They say, well, okay, well, it's a staff. And God says, okay, throw it down. And he threw it down. And it turned into a snake. And what do you do when you come across a snake in the desert? Well, you run the other direction from it. But God said to Moses, okay, now reach down and pick it up by the tail. That's how Steve Irwin learned to pick snakes up. The crocodile hunter, you pick him up by the tail. And as Moses picked the snake up by the tail, it turned back into a staff. And so God said this, here we go. That used to be your staff, but now that's my staff. And now I have proved to you that you've got all you need to march into Egypt and do exactly what I am calling you to do, to be a blessing to your people, to release two and a half million people out of slavery and take them to the promised land. You've got everything you need to do that. All you need is what you've already got in your hand. It's not going to cost you a dime. And so he did. And as Moses went into Egypt with that staff, he did some amazing things. He held it out over the Red Sea and parted the waters and destroyed the armies of Pharaoh that were coming after the Hebrew people after they'd been released. He took that staff and he pounded it on a rock and he made water in the desert for a lot of thirsty people. He took his staff and he held it out over a battle and as he held the staff there, the battle went in favor of the Israelites and they won a great victory. And that's all it took. See, to begin with, that staff was Moses' staff, and he threw it down on the ground as Moses' staff, but when he picked it back up, now it was God's staff, and big things began to happen. And so that's what God says to us today when he calls us to do various things. Now, if you're new to the Bible... You can read about this. You go back in your Old Testament. There's the first book of the Old Testament is Genesis. The next book is Exodus. And you read that account of all the things that happened in the life of Moses and the Israelite people. It's astounding. 
And you can go to the New Testament and you can find an example just like this of what happened when somebody had something that looked like it wasn't worth very much at all but offered it up to God and it became something else. It was a little boy with a sack lunch. Now you look in the New Testament in the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the sixth chapter, there's the account there of where Jesus was with his disciples. And as usually happened, there was a big crowd that began to gather around him, and they came around lunchtime. And they were hungry. And so Jesus asked one of his disciples, he asked Philip, he said, Philip, where are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? And Jesus already knew what he was going to do. But he was testing Philip to see what he'd say, and Philip said, well, I don't know. There, uh, you know, it would take just a, a boatload of money to buy enough bread to feed these people if we could even find enough bread stockpiled somewhere that you could buy for that. I don't know. It's impossible. There's no way we're going to feed all these people. And Andrew said, well, here's a, here's a little guy with a lunch. He's got five bar barley loaves and two dried up fish. You know, maybe, I don't know. I don't think that's going to do it. And I always wonder, you know, we, we tend to embellish this story. Like this was a cute little boy that was standing here with his little sack of lunch with his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he overhears all this and he comes and offers it to Jesus. And maybe he did. Maybe that's exactly what happened. But maybe it was just one of those things where the disciples looked down and said, Shit, well, yeah, there's a sack of lunch. Maybe well, that would work. You know, maybe in a little sarcastic way. Or maybe they weren't as, as sarcastic as I am today. I don't know. We don't know how it happened. But Jesus, you know, maybe he looked at this little boy and he said, Hey, little buddy, come over here. Let me see what you got in your sack. Opens up the sack, takes out the barley loaves, the fish. Raises it up to God, says a prayer of blessing over it, and he begins to break it. And he keeps breaking, and he keeps breaking. And the people that he gives the bread to, they keep breaking, and they keep breaking. And there's this incredible miracle that happens. Everybody gets fed. Over 5,000 people get fed. So much so, everybody goes home full with doggy bags. Huge leftovers from this feast that came out of this lunch. From a little boy, it just started out as a little boy's lunch. Not worth very much at all. But he offered it up to God. He put it in God's hands. And that came back as God's lunch. And came back as a blessing to a lot of people when it was turned over to him didn't cost that boy, little boy a thing. All he had to do was to look and see what he already had in his hand to offer up to God. So what do you have in your hand this morning? You might be saying, you know, I would really like to bless the people that I love. I wish I had more ways to do that. I wish I could be a better benefit to people who are, are in need or people who need some encouragement. But I'm just broke. I am flat broke and I have no business going into further debt for a bunch of gifts this Christmas. And God says to you and He says to me, you know what? It doesn't really matter what your financial situation is. What do you got in your hand? What do you already have that you could release to me that could be offered to somebody else that could be a blessing to them in ways that you haven't thought about yet. What have you got? Well, we got time, don't we? Now, I don't have any time. I'm so booked up. No, we've all got time. We've all got, everybody's got the same amount, 24 hours a day. We've got time. Just depends how we want to allot that time. We've got energy. We've got smiles. We've got hands. We've got feet. We've got a lot of things already there available to us, available to other people that don't cost us anything. That can mean a lot to people. You know, yesterday that happened in a big way here, here in the building. We had our toy giveaway through the Christian Outreach Ministry. And many of you participated in that. Some of you, you bought toys. You had the money. You could go and buy nice new toys for this. Some of you offered up things you already had. Gently used toys. And then some of you came and you helped to sort those toys and get them arranged on tables. And other, of, others of you came yesterday and helped people shop, although this, this cost nothing. You helped these families who were not going to have toys. This was the only place they were going to get help. They weren't getting help anywhere else in the city. And so you helped them and their children to have a very Merry Christmas that they wouldn't have had otherwise. God bless you for that. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. 
There's all kinds of ways that that can happen. And I'm going to just offer a list of things that maybe you could do one of these things. You might want to write one or two of these things down if it seems like a good idea to you. Or maybe it'll spark some other thinking that you have of things, gifts that you could give that cost you little or maybe cost you nothing but are priceless in value. There are international students here in town international students at UC in Northern Kentucky and other universities, there are a million of them nationwide. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of them are here in Cincinnati. But 75% of them, through their four or five, however many years they're here, 75% of them will never be invited to an American home, an indigenous American home like us. 80% of them will never experience any kind of a Christian context. They'll never come into a, a Christian place of, of worship and experience that. Well, we can offer that. We're all going to have holiday meals. We're all going to have parties. You could add one more or two more or three to the guest list easily. Contact Pat Durst at the email that's up there on the screen and she can set you up. Probably will be an Indian student. There are a lot of Indian students at UC. They speak really good English. There will be no language barrier. And they will just have a great time watching you have a great time with your family and discovering Christmas. You can buy Christmas dinner for someone who isn't going to have a Christmas dinner otherwise. You can contact Norwood Matt. This is Matt Clemens. NorwoodMatt at gmail.com. So far, we have 30 people who have signed up who've said, yes, we would like to have someone provide a Christmas dinner for us. We have 28 Parkside people who have said, yes, we will make that dinner possible. So we need some more. And we know there's going to be more requests coming. So keep your offers coming. You don't have to cook the dinner. You just buy the dinner, hand it to them on December the 18th, and they'll cook the dinner, and it'll be a blessing to them. Now, I know that involves some money that may not be in the wheelhouse. So we'll move on. You could leave... If not an outrageous tip in a restaurant, I know, okay, that's money. Hopefully you'll, you'll leave an appropriate tip for a server in a restaurant. But write something on the receipt that you give to them. Nice job. You're really good at this. You gave us such a pleasant evening. I would say they probably rarely ever get words like that or say it to them personally because they get a lot of guff <laughs> as well. Speak an encouraging word. When you send your Christmas cards... If, if you do that, it's so nice to do that. It's nice to receive that. You know, we sign our names to those. Why not write a note and say, this is why I, you're on my list and why I'm sending you a nice card like this because this is what you mean to me. Two or three more sentences to warm up that Hallmark message and you really are sending the very best when you do that. Maybe you have a friend that you know has lost a loved one this year. This is an especially hard time for them right now to be going through this season without them. And for you to write a note, maybe write a note in the Christmas card or just say to them personally, I'm so sorry. I miss your loved one too. And I'm thinking about you and praying for you through this season. You could turn a day around, you could turn a week around for somebody like that just to know that somebody else remembers and cares. Christmas morning. Christmas is on Sunday this year. And yes, we're going to have worship service uh, this, this Christmas here. But wouldn't it be fun to do something special for those who are going to have to work on Christmas morning? You know, police, I gotta, are they going to be on the job Christmas morning? Maybe you could take some donuts or breakfast to the police. Now, I don't think you can just walk into a police station. I don't think it works that way. So I don't know how you get, maybe, I don't know, speed down Beachmont, and maybe you'll find one. And uh, say, here, here's some Krispy Kreme. Um, people in the fire station, I think you can walk into a fire station and do something nice for the firefighters. People in, uh, staff in nursing homes, they have to work that day. People on the hospital floors have to work that day. And there, I'm sure there's others as well that I'm, I'm not thinking of. That's an excused absence from worship. We, I'll write you a note if you can't be here because you're going to go do something like that for somebody else. What a nice gesture that would be on Christmas morning. Provide some help at the Ronald McDonald House. You can go to their website and uh, see what they're asking uh, as far as, as services and resources that they need. Things that won't cost you much at all, if anything. Take a cup, uh, take a, a spiced latte to the guy that rings the bell at the Salvation Army uh, 
bucket. Uh, put some money in his bucket. Give him something warm to drink. The guy at the corner up there, have you seen him at the town center with the bullhorn, with the sign? He's preaching. He's preaching about Jesus. And yeah, that's something you may not see me doing. But God bless him for getting out there and, and doing that. He'd probably like it if somebody came up and handed him a hot chocolate and said, Merry Christmas, God bless you for doing what you're doing. Offer some free babysitting to a family that's going to have a tough time to get out to do their Christmas shopping, especially for a single mom or a single dad. Say, go get lost for three hours. Do whatever you got to do, and we'll cover things here at home for you. Now, this is a little bit more of a stretch. Go to HamiltonCountyKids.org and learn how to be trained as a respite caregiver for foster families because they are really tied down as to what they can do and who can come in and provide babysitting for them. It can't be just anybody. It's got to be a trained respite caregiver. If you would do that and offer that as a gift to a foster care family, they would love you forever for doing that. Pick a neighbor. It, when first snow that comes, pick a neighbor. And maybe you could do this real sneaky light. And go over and shovel their walk, maybe when they're away at work. And uh, don't even tell them who it was. Just leave a note that says Jesus was here. <laughs> Volunteer with the local chapter of the USO to support the military. Help serve at the Beach, uh, Beach Acres Parenting Center's Christmas party. It's going to be here in this room. Oh, well, I'm thinking of it. I can't forget this. We're, sit, we're taking up chairs today, but leave the first four rows, okay? Just do it. You don't need to know why. Just do it. Leave the first four rows and stack the rest of the chairs. So all of you in the first four rows, you sat up front, you can feel smug, okay? Um, where was I? What was I talking about here? Oh, the party next Friday. There's going to be a party here next Friday for the Beach Acres Parenting Center. So all these foster families are going to be coming in here for this party. And our missional community is going to provide support for that. But they could use more bodies, more support. If you can help do that, contact julielgetz at gmail.com and she'll tell you what's involved with doing that. Volunteer at City Gospel Mission. You can find their website. Buy a duck or a goat or a fruit tree or a sewing machine for somebody in a third world country. You can go to IDES.org, International Disaster Emergency Service. You can do this in a lot of organizations, but we happen to know this one well. And you can provide something that to us seems like, what's the big deal? A duck, a goat. For, for us, a goat is a pet. For them, a goat is life. Now again, that involves money, you know, 60, 70, 80 dollars or something like that. Maybe you don't have that. You can buy garden seed. I think for four dollars, you can send garden seed to somebody. I think, who can't get garden seed? Well, those people can't. <laughs> and we can provide it. That's another idea of things that we can do. Get creative. You can go to randomactsofkindness.org slash kindness, and there's a zillion ideas of, of random nice things you can do for people, and you've probably got lots of ideas of your own and things that maybe you're already doing. So here's what we're going to do with this. On Christmas Sunday morning, we're going to provide in our, our seats here Christmas ornaments, cardstock Christmas ornaments with things to write with. And we'd like you to write on your Christmas ornament just what you have done through this season to be a blessing to somebody else. Gifts that are priceless that maybe cost you nothing at all. Gifts that we're going to offer up to Jesus and say, Jesus, this was done in your honor. Maybe we had the chance to say a good word for him as we were doing this. This is in the whole spirit of you giving yourself to us. We're giving you to other people and the blessing of you to brighten somebody else's holiday. So we're going to write these on, on these, this cardstock and then we'll bring them and we're going to hang them on a tree and decorate a tree for Jesus with all the gifts that we're bringing for him on Christmas morning morning. And this will be a, a fun thing for kids. It's going to be a very, it'll be a short service. It's going to be about 45 minutes long. And if, if we're wrong about that, you can get up and leave at 45 minutes if I'm not done, okay? I, you're allowed to do that. Your kids, give them something to do. They can participate in this. Come up, decorate the tree. It'll be a lot of fun and a nice way to spend Christmas morning together. So, of course, this isn't just a Christmas challenge. This is a life challenge. This is just how we live life as God's people. There's so many opportunities to step into other people's lives and offer things that don't cost anything. Things that we already have in our hands. 
And as we make our list of excuses sometimes and we say, God, I just I don't have time to go free two million people from slavery or to feed 5,000 people or to be a blessing to my difficult neighbor next door or this person over across the street that needs, seems to be so needy. And God says, you know what? what? What do you got in your hand? Just look down. What do you already have? All it's going to cost you is some love and some compassion and some concern a smile on your face, hands and feet. That's all it's going to cost you. Throw it down. Throw it down. And then take it back up again after you've invited me into this. And watch what can happen with what you already have. I love how it describes Moses after he got done with his conversation with God there at the burning bush. It says that Moses took his wife and his sons and he put them on a donkey and he started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. That's significant. You see, when he threw it down, that was Moses' staff. But when he took it back up, now it was God's staff. Now it was the staff of God. And watch out for what happened after that. And he led two and a half million people to the brink of the promised land. And so God still says to you and me, what do you got? What do you already have that's in your hand? You've got something. Throw it down. Now pick it up. And use it for my benefit. Use it in the way, use it in the ways that I love, in the lives of people that I love. And watch out. And watch what can happen. It's the gift that's priceless. It's the gift that everybody can afford. It's the gift that costs us nothing financially.